Fireside Christmas Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various. The Shepherd Who Didn't Go by J. T. Stocking. You have all heard of the shepherds who went to Bethlehem, but I do not believe any of you have heard of the shepherd who didn't go. The Bible does not say anything about him, but his story has come to me and I am going to tell it to you. The city of Bethlehem stood on a hill. Below the town, with its steep, narrow streets and white walls, were gray olive orchards. Below the orchards were gardens bright with flowers. Below the gardens lay green meadows, and beyond these pasture lands that stretched away to the wilderness plains where little patches of grass grew among the bushes and between the great rocks. There were caves among these rocks where wolves used to skulk and sometimes robbers hid. So the shepherds who guarded their flocks in these wild pastures dared not leave them alone. One clear, beautiful night many centuries ago four shepherds were watching their flocks on these pastures. Samuel, Ezra, Joel, and David were their names. Samuel, Ezra, and Joel were strong men, no longer young, with shaggy eyebrows and brown beards. Ezra's was short, Joel's long, and Samuel's streaked with gray. They owned the flocks which they tended. David was a boy with ruddy cheeks, bright eyes, and strong, lithe limbs. He cared for the flocks of old Abraham. Abraham was old and rich and did not work any more, but hired David, whose family was very poor, to care for his sheep. The flocks of the four shepherds were lying quiet on the plains far below the city, and nearby Samuel, Ezra, Joel, and David lay wrapped in their shepherd's cloaks. Samuel, said David, rising upon his elbow. What is it, David? asked the other in a deep voice. Are you not glad that you tend sheep in Bethlehem instead of some distant place? Why, David? asked Samuel sleepily. Because it is in Bethlehem that the king we have been looking for so long is to be born. I have been reading it in the prophets only today. Have you only just heard of that? asked Ezra sourly. No, replied the boy hotly. I have heard my mother tell of it ever since I can remember, and I have read it over and over again. Samuel. Yes, David. Do you think we shall ever see the promised king? I do not know, my boy, the older man answered sadly. We have waited long, and there seems little hope for Israel now. But he will come some day. He will come some day. Why do you ask, David? I cannot tell. That is often in my mind. Something makes me think of it tonight. Perhaps it is because I read of him today. Samuel, I would walk to the end of the earth to see the Christ child. Well, you need not start now, grumbled Ezra, and Joel added roughly, Go to sleep, boy, the hour is late. It was much later before David fell asleep, for his head was full of dreams and the stories of wonderful days to come that his mother had told him but at length he joined the rest in healthy slumber. Suddenly it seemed to each of them that something had passed over him and touched him lightly on the cheek. The older men raised themselves on their elbows, but David sprang to his feet. At first they saw only a great light which nearly blinded them, then they discerned a shining form in the sky and heard a voice say, Be not afraid, for behold I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all the people, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Saviour who is Christ the Lord, and this is the sign unto you. Ye shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And then all the sky was full of light, and the air was full of heavenly voices singing, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. While the shepherds listened, half joyful, half afraid, the light faded, and the voices floated away, Good will to men, to men, to men. And all was still as before. For a moment the shepherds looked at each other in silent awe and wonder. Then Ezra spoke in a voice dry with fear. What was it? David stood speechless, and Samuel answered reverently, Angels. Brothers, he continued, a wonderful thing has happened to us. It has been a long, long day since angels have spoken to men. Then he girded his shepherd's cloak about him and seized his staff. Come, Ezra, Joel, David, let us be going. Going where? asked Ezra and Joel. Why, to Bethlehem, to see the child. Did not the angel tell us the sign? Let us go at once to find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. There be many mangers in Bethlehem, objected Ezra. I know not how we shall find him, said Joel. It is a vain search, I fear. And he drew his cloak about him and reached for his staff. But I will go with you if you say. So they started, Samuel, Ezra, and Joel. But David stood still. Come, David, make haste, called Samuel. But the boy did not move. I cannot go, he said. "'Cannot go?' cried Samuel in amazement, and Ezra added, "'Who said but a little while ago that he would go to the end of the earth to see the king?' 
And so I would, cried David, but the sheep, we cannot leave the sheep alone. The sheep will be safe enough, said Samuel. The dogs will keep them together. There are no wolves tonight. Come, David. But the boy was firm. There is my master. He'll be angry if I leave his flocks alone. Old Abraham will never know, said Joel. Abraham is a hard master, said David. Many a time I have felt his heavy staff on my back, but it is not that which keeps me. I have given my word that, come day, come night, come life, come death, I will not fail to keep the flocks. Go on without me. I must keep my word. Go on. So they went on, impatient and eager for this wondrous quest, Ezra and Joel muttering now and then at the obstinacy of the boy, but Samuel full of glowing admiration. David watched them as they moved up the hill. That dream of finding the Christ child, how could he give it up? Once he started forward, I will go! But something held him back, and he threw himself upon the ground and kept back tears of bitter disappointment. After a time he grew calmer, and found a certain comfort in thinking of the helplessness of his flock. Suddenly the low growling of his dog brought him to his feet, but he saw nothing, heard nothing, and bade the dog be still. In a moment, with a bark of alarm, the dog was up again and away. David sprang up, certain now that danger was near. There was panic in the flock. Toward the wilderness he could see lean, gray forms moving stealthily and swiftly among the sheep. Wolves! Springing upon a rock and waving his cloak in circles about his head, he uttered the familiar call which gathered the sheep about him, his own sheep nearest, and behind them the flocks of Samuel, Ezra, and Joel. The wolves made off, and David quickly looked over his flock to see if all were there, for the eastern shepherd knows his sheep by name. One by one he named them, with an increasing feeling of relief. They were all there, no, one was missing. Kebarbara, the pet of the flock. Kebarbara means striped, and the little sheep was so called because of the dark marking of her fleece. After waving his staff over the huddled beasts, and uttering a few times the soothing cry, Hoo-ta! Hoo-ta! He rushed off in the direction which the wolves had taken. At the top of the steep bank, at the edge of the pasture, he stopped and called, Kebarbara! Kebarbara! And for an answer, heard an anguished bleat from the rocks below. It was a steep and slippery way, but David plunged down with no thought of anything but the sheep. Loose stones gave way and he lost his footing. At the bottom he picked himself up unhurt, and there beside him were two wolves quarreling over the wounded sheep. One of them slunk away at sight of the boy, but the other had a taste of blood and sprang at David, missing his throat but sinking his teeth into his leg. Then David, as the beast turned to spring again, struck him a heavy blow on the head with his staff and killed him. His own wounds were bleeding and painful, but he turned at once with caressing words to the sheep. Barbara, they have hurt you, little sheep, but they have not killed you. I reached you just in time. You cannot walk, can you? And I am afraid I cannot carry you. But I can help. There, put your head on my arm. He groaned with pain. No, the other one. So he talked to her, as to a child, as the wounded boy and the wounded sheep slowly made their way up the steep hillside and over the rough rocks. It was not a long way, and half an hour before the sturdy shepherd lad would have bounded over it quickly enough. But now the wounded leg was slow, the wounded arm was weak, and the wounded lamb seemed very heavy. It was a weary journey, with many stops. When at last they reached the flock, still huddled trembling together, David had only strength to give one reassuring, Ooh, ta, then fell exhausted. How long he lay there he did not know, but the dawn was growing bright when three men appeared from the direction of the town. It was not the shepherds, but old Abraham and two of his servants. As the old man caught sight of his flock, but he saw no shepherd, he raged with anger. David! he shouted fiercely. David! There was no answer. The young vagabond, he has left the sheep. Of great worth are his promises. He would keep my flock. Come life, come death. David! Let me once find him and I will give him something he will remember longer than he does his vows. As he drew near the flock, he discovered the boy lying on the ground. Ah, sleep is he, and the sun this high. Come, get up! He shouted fiercely and lifted his staff to strike. But as he did so, he caught sight of the white face and the bleeding arm and noticed the wounded sheep. Old Abraham dropped his angry arm, and there was a touch of tenderness that was strange to him as he continued, Ah, David, boy, you did not forget your promises, did you, David? And I would have struck you. Forgive me, my lad. Then turning to his servants, he gave them command. Take him to the inn and bid them care for him. I myself will keep the flock today. The servants bowed low. The inn is full, my lord. Old Abraham commanded again positively. Take him to the inn, I say. But the inn is full, my lord, replied the older servant, trembling. Then the other servant spoke. There is perhaps room in the stable, my lord. Then bear him thither and bid them give him the best of care. Go at once. So the servants bore David away, still unconscious from his wounds, and made him comfortable on a bed of straw in the stable of the inn. It was some hours before he came to himself. 
When at last he opened his eyes and his ears began to catch once more the sounds about him, the first thing he heard was a faint cry. "'What is that?' he asked eagerly of Samuel, who was watching beside him. "'That,' said the old shepherd in tones of mingled joy and reverence, "'is the child the angels told us about. The child we came to see. We found him here in the stable, in a manger.' "'And am I not to see him?' "'Yes, you are,' said Samuel, and a grave-faced man brought the child and laid him in David's arms, the child for whose coming the people had been longing for a thousand years. The color at length came back to David's white cheeks and strength and health to his limbs, and he went back again to the plain. Old Abraham embraced him. "'Forgive me, my son. I have been a hard master. Thou hast been very faithful, and for thy reward I make thee lord over all my flocks, and half of them shall be thine own.' So David became a man of flocks, and all his days he was known among the other shepherds as the one who had held the Christ child in his arms. And there was none among them who was thought so brave and gentle and wise as the shepherd who didn't go. End of The Shepherd Who Didn't Go by J. T. Stocking Recording by Angela